Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight, and it's July 3rd, 2014. Here are our top stories. Tonight, the TSA will celebrate the 4th of July by violating your Fourth Amendment. Then, what do you have to hide? Visiting privacy websites gets you put in a NSA database. And another economist says war is the health of the state. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Hardcore savage death machines, ready to kill you and your family, and they can't wait. They're going to murder all of us dead under the hammer. Well, tomorrow is the 238th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Now, a lot of people travel on the 4th of July. Obama just unveiled a new highway bill. How is that going to affect you on future 4th of Julys? We're also going to look at what's happening with our military, both abroad and how are we treating our veterans? Has America become the new empire? But first, let's take a look at the Declaration of Independence itself. It's actually in the news. The New York Times is wondering about this period that is maybe there and maybe isn't. They say, if only Thomas Jefferson could settle the issue. Well, you know, Jefferson had something to say about it. He says, I set out on this ground, which I suppose to be self-evident, not just using that phrase in the Declaration of Independence. He says, the earth belongs to the living. The dead have neither powers nor rights over it. It's up for us to decide how we want to live. Now, of course, the Declaration of Independence is an important document. It was a founding document. It was a document of secession. And it was based on whether or not the government was recognizing the rights that we possess as human beings. Was it securing those rights or was it destroying those rights? But the discussion is now focusing on this period. If you've ever memorized the Declaration of Independence, and I'm sure as a child in school, they had you memorize the first part of the first paragraph, they had you stop after the pursuit of happiness. That's not really the way it was written, I believe. I think that it's very clear that it has subordinate clauses to it that he's laying out a whole list of what the government is supposed to do. But this is what a scholar from Princeton is saying. This is Danielle Allen. She says, a period that appears right after the phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the transcript is certainly not, she maintains, on the badly faded parchment original. And this is what she says about it. She says, the logic of the sentence moves from the value of individual rights to the importance of government as a tool for protecting those rights. If you lose that connection when the period gets added, I don't think that's the case. I think if you look at the actual language, it talks about, this is all in the first paragraph, it says that all men are created equal. Then it says that governments are instituted to secure these rights. Then it says that when they become destructive of the rights, we alter or abolish them. Those are the three phrases. That's the progression of logic that follows in that first sentence. There's three that's, that, 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 that men are created equal, that government is there to secure those rights, and that we have a right and a duty to get rid of governments that don't secure those rights. You know, we have had theologians who argue about how many angels can fit on the head of a pen. We've now got lawyers arguing about whether or not there's a period there. We can read the document for ourselves. Read it for yourself tomorrow and for your family. Well, you know, the government is always trying to reinterpret the plain language. Maybe they don't want us to even speak English. Look at this article. Federal government sues Wisconsin company and says English language requirement is discrimination. The EEOC, a federal agency tasked with enforcing work workplace discrimination laws, is suing a private American business because they fired a group of Hispanic and Asian employees because they couldn't speak English at work. Now, Judicial Watch, uh, Irene Garcia, the blog editor and the Spanish media liaison for them, called the accusation ludicrous. She says, it's ludicrous and an overreaching of government. If you're a private company in the U.S., you should be able to require your employees to speak English. Well, it's not just being able to speak English. It's also forgetting our history and not just the Declaration of Independence, our recent history. Look at what the BBC reporter is saying about this new Google moving to suppress legitimate journalism. This is an article from Paul Joseph Watson. This is in response, of course, to the recent legislation in the EU, the right to be forgotten ruling. Paul Joseph Watson gives us a background. He says a recent ruling in the European Court of Justice mandated that Google must delete, quote, inadequate irrelevant and no longer relevant data when it receives a request to do so, which could open the floodgates for powerful individuals, corporations, and institutions to hide past evidence of wrongdoing and a chilling throwback to George Orwell's memory hole. 
Precisely. Now, in this particular case, we've got the BBC economics editor, Robert Preston, who says that he had an article that was taken out, a 2007 article about a former Merrill Lynch boss, Stan O'Neill, and his role in the financial collapse. Now, understand, Google will still have that information. The public just won't have that information. So essentially what they're doing is they're destroying people's rights to publish. And they're also doing the same as if they had a prior constraint. This is a post constraint of free speech. This is taking away something in 2014 that was written in 2007. It's still censorship being performed in the name of privacy. The London Guardian had it right. They said that six of their articles had vanished down the memory hole, and they said there will likely be many more as the rich and powerful look to scrub their online images, doubtless with the help of a new wave of reputation management firms. And they point out that this should reside with the people who are publishing the information. If it's a Guardian article, if it's an InfoWars article, somebody has a problem with what's there, we already have rules that can take that down. If something is said about somebody that is not true, that's slander or libel, you have a court process to handle that. We should not be able to have a third party or the government censor information that other people have written. And that's what's going to happen. If you can't find it online, it essentially hasn't been published or it's been depublished. Now, we also have other news in terms of websites. We now see that the NSA uh, is looking at people who have even Googled on how they can get their privacy. Now, while they're trying to justify an Orwellian memory hole in the name of privacy, look at the hypocrisy. Merely visiting a website to find out how you can keep your actions private from the NSA and other spies gets you on a list of extremists. This is an article by Paul Joseph Watson. He points out in an article for the German news outlet, it reveals how the NSA's deep packet inspection rules which it uses to determine who to target for deep surveillance includes looking at web users who search for articles about Tor and Tails, anonymous browser and privacy-friendly operating systems. Anybody who actually looks at how they can become, how they can protect their privacy is now considered to be an extremist. It makes you an enemy of the state. And also on this 4th of July weekend, we see that the TSA is now striking up fear of traveling as they've opened up the borders. For everyone and anything to come in over the borders, now they're going to step up the examinations at the airports. TSA plans enhanced security for 4th of July travelers. In an article by Kurt Nemo, he writes that Saudi and CIA-supported terrorists are now being determined to disrupt the 4th of July holiday. I guess they just hate us for our freedoms. Or maybe that's the feds. Now, this week, of course, is a heavy traveling weekend for most people in the United States, and Obama released a new highway funding program this week. Now, when he released it, he said that it's not socialism, and it's not an imperial presidency, and it's not crazy. But I kind of remember a time when big spending bills and appropriations originated in the House like it did in the Constitution. This is an important bill because we've had a lot of jobs that have come back since the major recession. There's been a 12% increase in transportation jobs, and that includes airports, trucks, as well as rail. There's four and a half million people that work in that sector, not even counting taxis. But of course, uh, as you look at these job figures, we know that they're constantly rigging the figures, they're constantly readjusting these figures. Still, it's a major portion of the economy. And so when Obama says that our infrastructure is decaying, and it truly is decaying, what's he going to do about it? Well, he's seizing the initiative on it without waiting for Congress. And of course, Congress is passively setting back and letting him do it. The mainstream media has been preparing the way for this for quite some time. For a number of weeks, they've been talking about increases in federal gas taxes, saying that they're going to increase it by 12 cents. 12 cents. No, it's actually 12 cents on an 18 cent base. That's a 67% increase in your gas taxes. And understand that when they increase the gas taxes with federal taxes, and everybody is aware there's going to be a jump at the pump, then they're going to increase it at the state level. And the companies that are providing gasoline to you are going to increase their prices. Everyone is going to say, including these transportation companies, that now their costs have gone up. So they're going to raise the costs everywhere. You're going to see a massive increase in inflation. But look at how they're going to pay for it. We only have the only house involvement that we've got is a house plan to change tax structure that's coming from the house GOP 
This is a Republican chairman of the tax writing House Ways and Means Committee. He unveiled a bold but politically hazardous overhaul of the nation's tax laws, according to the Washington Post. He's doing things like getting rid of all personal exemptions for you, for your spouse, for your dependents, no more credit for child care, no more deductions for medical bills, for state or local taxes. Any mortgage interest deductions will be taken away if the mortgage is worth more than $500,000. Now that may sound like a lot, but I remember a time when the average or the median price of homes was one-tenth of what it is today. Inflation comes about very quickly, and when we have an inflationary tax structure, when we have a 67% increase in our gasoline taxes, that's going to fuel that kind of inflation. Now, the Washington Post points out that K Street lobbyists are very busy opposing this, and it really doesn't have a chance of passing. So, of course, it is going to go through that 67% tax increase. But let's look at not only how much it's going to cost, but what they're going to buy with it. The White House put out a fact sheet talking about President Obama laying out his vision for 21st century transportation infrastructure. Hmm, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like Agenda 21, and yes, it is in there. When he says this is not socialism, this is what he's talking about. He knows that people are going to criticize this because it is socialist planning. This is $302 billion that they're going to put in. And one of the very first line items on his fact sheet is Tiger Competitive Grants. Now, maybe you haven't heard about those, but this is something that they've used to build transportation infrastructure. Or is it? No, actually, if you go back to March 22nd, Reason Foundation had an interesting article about what these Tiger Grants are doing and how they're not really tied to transportation. In this particular article, they talk about the city of Fresno, California, that's decided to try to revive a mall that's fallen into a dilapidated state. They got transportation funds of $15 million. Now, he's got earmarked for the Tiger competitive grants. He's got $600 million. So he could do one of these pretty much in nearly every state. Now, one of the things about this that they loosely tied this into transportation with was that this mall was close to the hub of a California high-speed rail system. Now, the authority is trying to get money to build this high-speed rail system because that's always the dream of the government. They always want to control your transportation. They don't want you to be independent in your own car. They want to put you in buses, especially into light rail. That's always been their dream. Problem is that in California, the only funds that the high-speed rail line has received is $3.5 billion from the feds. And the initial operating section alone is going to require $31 billion. But it's worse than that. Go back to his fact sheet. Look at the bottom of it. It says $4 billion to attract private investment in transportation infrastructure. Now, why would he have to attract private investment if it's a good deal? But of course, this is money that's going to be going to his crony capitalist friends and to bankers. Listen to how he describes it. He's going to capitalize a national infrastructure bank. He's going to create American fast forward bonds. There we go. It's going to be for the bankers. And what are they going to build with it? Well, it's going to be light rail systems, and it's going to be regional transportation systems. A good example of that is what's going on in Florida. They have a project, 750. It's the word seven and the number 50 that's been opposed by people in Florida for quite some time now. And the Palm Beach Post reported back on February the 4th of this year that the people were essentially up in arms. They had to call extra deputies. One was ejected from the Palm Beach County Commission meeting. Nearly 80 people showed up wearing red t-shirts to show solidarity, waving tiny American flags. They packed the county commission chambers because they're in opposition to this plan. Why? Because they said it's a giant step in the systematic erosion of property rights. Yes, exactly like Agenda 21. A mayor who went to one of their plans, a Mayor Craig Fletcher, who attended one of the briefings given by the proponents of 750, reported that city and county government would be less important. Only mega regions are important, just like in the EU. The seven Florida counties that are part of the partnership would have someone to control them. They are not going to put up with the American education system, and he says, quote, Fascism is the best form of government.